Our sermon passage this morning is from Revelation chapter 8. So turn there with me to the last book of the Bible. I'll read Revelation 8, verses 6 through 12. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Thank you, Mallory. Well, this morning, as Mallory mentioned, we're continuing our sermon series in the book of Revelation. And as we do, um, I'm going to do something a little bit different uh, than I normally do in a sermon. Um, those are usually my, my famous last words, um, thinking and do something a little different. And I look back and I'm like, why in the world did I do that? Um, hopefully that's not the case this morning. But, but usually when I preach um, a sermon, I uh, we just take the passage of Scripture, as you know, just walk line by line, verse by verse uh, through the passage, and I try and structure the, the outline um, of the sermon uh, and just based upon the, the structure of the passage, just the, just the flow of the, of the passage. But this morning, I'm going to do something a, a little bit different. You probably can see that maybe on your, your handout that you have there, but instead of structuring the sermon uh, just based upon the, the structure of this passage and the flow of this passage. Instead, I want to organize this sermon and structure it around two main questions. And, and the reason I want to do this is, is that these two questions are two questions that I hope will help us to better understand and to know just even how to better read Revelation. Revelation and how to understand and how to read this, this passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, and to better understand how, how it applies and, and the implications of it for our lives as well. And so the main reason I want to do that is because if you didn't notice, as Mallory is reading, there's a lot of funky stuff in this passage. Like this passage is, is hard. It's hard. It's not the easiest passage to understand and, and make sense of, and it, it raises like a whole host of questions. And so like, you see all these trumpets being blown, and then you see all these weird and, and frightening things happen as, as a result. Like hell and fire mixed with blood raining down on the earth. Or you have like this massive mountain that's on fire that's thrown down into the sea. Or, or, or you have this, this huge star that's blazing like a torch that's falling into rivers and streams of water. It says here that a third of the earth is burned up. All the green grass on the earth is burned up. A third of the trees are burned up. And a whole host of other things. I don't know if you know this, but those are like terrifying images. Imagine just walking out after church this morning. And you see all this outside, like it's frightening. And not only that, but like I mentioned, what, what is, what's the deal with all these trumpets? All these trumpets going off and blaring and blasting. Like over the last couple chapters... If you remember, starting in chapter 6 through chapter 8, verse 5, we saw these seven seals. 
And now, starting in in chapter 8, verse 6, through what we're going to see all the way through chapter 11, we're going to see these seven trumpets. We're only going to look at the first four trumpets today in the the end of chapter 8 here. But in the chapters to come, we're going to see there's seven trumpets. So seven seals, and then seven trumpets. And so what's going on there? What, what's, what's, is that just a quinky dink? Like, what's going on there? Like, what's the relationship then between these seven seals and seven trumpets? Like, do the seven trumpets occur after the seven seals? Do they occur simultaneously and parallel to the seven seals? And not only that, but do these seven trumpets happen sometime in the future? Do the events that are being described here happen sometime in the future? Or maybe have they already happened in the past? Or are they happening maybe even right now? Like there's all these questions that we wonder and ask that make this a difficult passage to to understand and to try and answer. And because of that, then those are some of the reasons why I've organized this passage around these two main questions. That that I hope then, these two main questions I hope, will help us to answer all these other questions that I just brought up. And so then here here are the two questions that I've organized this this passage around, this sermon around, that I hope hope will help us to better understand it. And the first question is this. How should we read and understand these first four trumpet judgments in this passage? How how are we to read and understand these first four trumpet judgments in this passage? And the reason I phrase it that way with the word how, how, how should we read this? And therefore, how should we understand it? is because my hope this morning isn't simply to come here and tell you what this passage means. Like, that's not my point of this sermon and arranging this sermon this way. It's not just to get up here and tell you what this passage means. Instead, my hope this morning is to show you how to read this passage. Not just to tell you what it means, but to show you how to read this passage so you can understand what it means for yourself. Does that make sense? It's not just delivering you the food, but it's teaching you how to make the food. Teaching you how to read it so you can understand it. Not just simply me telling you what it means. So that's the first question. How should we read and understand these four trumpet judgments in this passage? And then the second question, which we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, but the second question at the very end then is how should we then respond? How should we respond to these four trumpet judgments in this passage? So the application to our lives. So question number one. Let me, let me say this first. In some ways... This morning might feel more like a a classroom in some ways than a sermon, but I but I hope it's it's helpful in terms of how to read uh, Revelation in general and specifically this passage. So, question number one: How then should we read and understand the trumpet judgments in this passage? Well, three ways. First, and I've mentioned this before, but we should read them cyclically, not chronologically. We should read them cyclically, not chronologically. In other words, it's easy to think that since the seven seals that we saw in chapter 6 through chapter 8, verse 5, that since they occur first before the seven trumpets, then the seven trumpets then happen, the events described in the seven trumpets then happen sequentially after the seven seals. In other words, they they occur in chronological order. That the seven seals take place first because they're mentioned first, then the events depicted in the seven trumpets take place after the seals, and so therefore they occur in this nice sequential timeline in chronological order, the specific events that are described in each. And there's a number of of Christian scholars and and pastors that would read them this way. They, They read them sequentially, as this timeline of events that will happen in the future, 
Most would say seven years before Jesus returns. However, I don't think that's the best way to understand these seven seals and these seven trumpets and the relationship between the two. I don't think they're to be read chronologically as if they occur in order, not sequential order. Instead, I believe they're to be read cyclically. In other words, here's what I mean by that. I believe that the seven seals and the seven trumpets describe different events that take place over the same, same period of time, namely between the time of Jesus' resurrection and ascension and Jesus' return. That that entire time period is characterized by the events that are described in the seven seals and the seven trumpets. It's in this way then that we can say that the events that are described in the seven seals and the seven trumpets have happened, are happening, and will continue to happen in the future until Jesus returns. And one of the reasons we, we know that is because of how the seven seals and the seven trumpets are structured. They're structured as cycles. In other words, the seven seals are the first cycle of judgments that God sends on the earth. And, and we saw this mainly in, in chapter 6, if you remember. Military conquest and war, murder and bloodshed, economic hardship and famine, death, martyrdom, all of those things, preliminary judgments leading up to the great day of God's wrath and the final judgment and the end of the world, like we saw in the sixth seal and the, and the seventh seals, which then makes it impossible, if that's the case, for the events that are described in the seven trumpet judgments to sequentially follow the seven seals. They can't sequentially follow the seven seals because the seven seals end with the end of the world, the great day of God's wrath, the final judgment, which means game, set, match, the game's over. Everything's over. Because of that then, it's best to understand the seven trumpets as a second cycle of judgments that God sends on the earth that occur during the same time period as the seven seals between the ascension of Jesus and the return of Jesus. That they both, the seven seals and the seven, seven trumpets, describe the same time period. They just focus on different types of God's judgments that he unleashes on the earth. The seven seals focus on how God sends war and murder and bloodshed and, and economic hardship on the earth, while the seven trumpets focus on God's judgment on creation and God's judgment on different parts of creation, like the land and the sea and the rivers and the springs of water and the sky and the sun and the moon and the, and the stars. And so this is the first way then that we're to read and understand these first four trumpet judgments in our passage here. We're to read them cyclically, not chronologically. But that's not all. Secondly then, we're also to read them symbolically, not literally. Symbolically, not literally. That as I mentioned and even referred to in my introduction of this sermon, there's, there's weird stuff in this passage like frightening stuff in this passage. Like, like look, at, look at verse 7. Again, the first trumpet's blown, and hell and fire mixed with blood falls on the earth. The second trumpet's blown, then you have a massive fiery mountain that's thrown into the sea. The third trumpet's blown, and a great star from heaven that's, that's blazing like a torch falls into the rivers and springs of water. The fourth trumpet's blown, and a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars all become darkened. And so you read all that, and you're trying to picture all this literally in your mind, and you begin to scratch your head, and, and it leads to this million-dollar question. And the million-dollar question is this. Is everything 
that's being described in this passage a literal description of events that either have occurred, will occur, or that are occurring right now? Is all this a literal description of of what's going to happen or what is happening or, or what has already happened? Well, there's a lot of people that take it that way. And they believe that, that everything in here is exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be this meteorite and, and all this other stuff that's coming from the sky and, and blood in the sea and, and all these things. I don't think that's the best way to read this passage and, and interpret these verses, though. And there's a lot of reasons why I don't believe that. But one of the main reasons I don't, I don't believe that that's how we're to read it, with this literal description, is because, as we've talked about before, that's not how you read apocalyptic literature. And Revelation is apocalyptic literature. Which, what I mean by apocalyptic literature, it's a literature that uses symbols. It's a literature that that uses symbolic and figurative language to represent someone or something that, that's true and real. And so then don't misunderstand me. John here is describing what he literally saw. Like he literally saw these things. But what he saw isn't a literal description of what happened in history. Instead, what he saw was, a symbol, was, was symbolic of certain truths and realities that these symbols that he literally saw are pointing to and representing. And if you've been with us up to this point in Revelation, we've seen this already over and over and over again throughout our study of Revelation. Like the church is symbolized by, earlier on in Revelation, lampstands. That doesn't mean that churches are literally lampstands. Right? Right. Like earlier we saw that Jesus is a lamb. Jesus isn't a literal lamb. He's not. We saw Jesus with a two-edged sword in his mouth. I hate to break the news. Jesus doesn't literally have a two-edged sword in his mouth. Instead, the, the sword symbolizes it represents something about Jesus. Namely, that he's the judge. So we don't read that literally. You ask yourself, what does that symbol, that symbolic language represent about Jesus? What do the lampstands represent and teach us about the church? What does Jesus being a lamb represent and teach us about who Jesus is? Not even, that's how you read apocalyptic literature. It's how it works. And that's the danger. If you begin to read apocalyptic literature like historical narrative, that get like the Gospel of Luke or 2 Samuel, that gives a literal description and historical account of of whatever it's talking about, you're going to come up with a lot of crazy stuff. You're going to scare yourself to death in the process. Instead, we're to read this symbolically. Symbolic, figurative language that represents someone or something that's true and real. And that's especially true when it comes to the numbers in Revelation. Like we've seen this already, right? All throughout the book of Revelation, all these numbers, numbers, numbers. If if you like math, you're going to like Revelation. Because there's numbers all over the place. And did you notice the primary number that's used in this passage here this morning? It's a fraction (laughs) for you math people. 13 different times we read the word a third. A third, a third, a third, a third, a third, a third. 13 different times in this passage. Verse 7, a third of the earth and trees are burned up. Verses 8 and 9, a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships on the sea are destroyed. Verses 10 11, a great star fell on a third of the rivers and springs water, and a third of the waters became wormwood. And then verse 12, watch this, a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were dark, and a third of the day was kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Thirteen different times, a third, a third, a third, a third, a third, all over this passage. Which then again begs the question, 
Is John here literally, is he giving us a literal percentage? Is he giving us a literal percentage? A third, 33.33333% of the earth is burned up. 33.333% of the trees are burned up. Or in verse 12, a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars are darkened. Does he literally mean 33.3% of the, of the sun and the moon and the stars are literally darkened? No. No. And some of the main re- one of the main reasons, again, I believe that is because we're not reading historical narrative. Like the Gospel of Luke that tells us that Jesus rose on the third day. What does that mean? It means he rose on the third day. Literally, the third day. We're not reading historical narrative. We're reading apocalyptic literature. Not only that, but everything else in this passage is symbolic and figurative. And so it would be logical then to understand that all these references to a third are figurative and symbolic as well. And not only that, but like I mentioned earlier, we see numbers used symbolically all over the book up to this point. Think about it, like the number seven. What does the number seven signify? It signifies fullness or completeness. We've seen the number 12 and multiples of the number 12. And what does 12 and multiples of the number 12 signify? They they signify all the people of God, the full, complete people of God. We've seen the number four over and over and over again. What does the number four signify? It signifies the whole earth, all directions, north, east, south, west, all of the earth. And so the same is true then when it comes to fractions in Revelation. This isn't the only time in Revelation that we're going to see fractions. We're going to see fractions all over this book. And here we see the fraction a third, a third, a third, a third. So what? what? What's that mean? What's what's this fraction signify? Well, throughout Revelation, fractions play this big big role, and they they signify the opposite of what whole numbers in Revelation signify. Most of the whole numbers in Revelation, 7, 12, 4, whatever, they signify that something is complete, it's full. Fractions signify the opposite. Fractions signify that something hasn't come to its end yet. Something's not complete yet. Something's not finished yet. And that's the whole point of all these references to a third in this passage. It's not giving us a literal description of how much the earth is burned up or a literal description of how much of the sea became blood. Instead, it signifies that God's judgment of creation isn't complete It's not done. It's not finished. In other words, it's signifying and showing us that these first four trumpet judgments aren't the final judgment. Instead, they're preliminary judgment. They're partial judgment. But the final judgment is still yet to come. That's what these fractions, and specifically this this fraction of a third, means and signifies in this passage. Which then begs this question, okay? You might be thinking, okay, I get it. We're not supposed to read these trumpet judgments as if they're literal descriptions. Instead, we're to read them symbolically. Well, that raises a question then. What then do these four trumpet judgments signify then? What do they represent? What do they, what do they symbolize then? Well, here's what they symbolize and represent and signify. These four trumpet judgments symbolize how God's judgment touches every part of creation. That's the simple truth here that these four trumpet blasts and judgments symbolize. They, They simply symbolize how God has poured out his judgment on every part of creation. And so, so look at that. And the, the, the first angel here in the first trumpet, in verse, verse 7, we, we see God's judgment poured out on what? On the land, on the trees and the grass. So, so the land. And the second trumpet here, we see God's judgment poured out on what? On the sea. 
The third trumpet judgment, we see God's judgment poured out on what? On the rivers and the springs of water. In the fourth trumpet judgment, we see God's judgment poured out on, on the sky and the heavens, meaning the, the sun and the moon and the, and the stars. That's the point. That every part of creation is under God's curse. Every part of creation is under God's judgment because of man's rebellion against him. Which is why we have earthquakes. It's why we have droughts. It's why we have tornadoes. It's why we have raging fires that destroy the land. It, it's why we have tsunamis. It's why we have hurricanes. It's why we have horrible oil spills in the ocean and the seas. And why we have shipwrecks in the sea that, that destroy the sea. And it's, it's why we have so many in this world that can, can't find clean water, who, but who, instead who just all they have is dirty, contaminated water in the, in the rivers and in the springs of water. Why is, why is all of that true? All of that true is because God's judgment, his curse, touches every part of creation. This is what creation under God's curse looks like. They're not just random events. They're just, oh, a tornado popped up. Oh, a hurricane popped up. Oh, there's an oil spill in the ocean. Oh, wow. These are all expressions of God's just judgment against sin that touches every part of creation. And that's going to continue on from this day all the way until Jesus returns and makes all things new. Which then leads to this third way we're to read and understand these trumpet judgments. We're, not to read, we're to read them cyclically, not chronologically. We're to read them symbolically and not literally. And then the third way we're to read them is this. We're, we're, we're to read them with the Old Testament in hand, not a newspaper. We're, we're to read them with the Old Testament, not a newspaper. And so I've mentioned this before, but this is really important. Like I would say this is the Prime, one of the primary things to, to remember when it comes to reading and, and understanding Revelation, and, and especially these first four trumpet judgments here, that when you read Revelation and these first four trumpet judgments here, don't try and interpret them by reading a newspaper and, and current day events or by looking into the future at future events down the road. Instead, interpret them by looking back into the Old Testament and see how the symbolic language that's used in Revelation is used in the Old Testament as well. Which, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, what is Revelation? Why is it the very last book in the Bible? Because it's the climax. It's the capstone of the entire storyline of the Bible. The entire storyline of the Bible finds its ultimate fulfillment in the book of Revelation. Like most scholars would say that Revelation has approximately 500 references or allusions to the Old Testament, if not more. And because of that then, putting all that together, what that means is this. The best way then to understand all this weird, figurative, symbolic language here in Revelation. Again, isn't to look at a newspaper in the current day events. Instead, it's to look back into the Old Testament and to see what these, temples, what these symbols meant and refer to in the Old Testament. And this is especially important when it comes to these four trumpet judgments here in chapter 8. Like, let's play a little game. Just stay with me here, right? Stay with me. Think about this. Put this into practice. Where in the Old Testament do we read about God sending hell and fire upon the earth like he does in this first judgment here? This first trumpet judgment here. We read about it in Exodus chapter 9, verses 22 and 25, when God sends the seventh plague on the land of Egypt. If you remember there, he sends hell and, and fire to strike down the plants and the trees and the fields, just like what we see happening in the first trumpet judgment here. Let's go to the second trumpet judgment then. Where in the Old Testament 
Do we read about God judging people by changing water into blood? Like he does in the second trumpet judgment here. And, and making the water unable to drink like he does in the third trumpet judgment here. We read it in the first plague that God sends on the land of Egypt in, in Exodus chapter 7. If you remember there, God turns all the water in the Nile River into blood, killing all the living creatures there and making the water stinky so nobody can drink of it. Third trumpet judgment then. Where in the Old Testament do we read about God judging people by sending darkness or, or fourth trumpet judgment, excuse me. Where in the Old Testament do we read about God judging people by sending darkness on the land, like in the fourth trumpet judgment? We read about it in the ninth plague that God sends on the land of Egypt in Exodus chapter 10. That if you remember there, Moses stretches his hand out toward the heavens, and when he does, darkness covers the land of Egypt for three entire days. And it doesn't stop there, though. Instead, those are just the four trumpet judgments. Instead, when we get to chapter 9, we're going to see that the fifth trumpet judgment corresponds to the eighth and the ninth plague. And then we're going to see that the sixth trumpet judgment corresponds to the second plague. And then when we get to chapter 11, we're going to see that the, the seventh trumpet judgment corresponds to the seventh plague. And you read that, and you like, huh, what a coincidence. And I'm like, not a coincidence. There's a divine author behind all this who's making an intentional connection here. And he's trying to show us how the trumpet judgments point back to the plagues that God poured out on the Egyptians in the Exodus. In other words, just like God poured out his judgment on Egypt for their sin and their rebellion against the Lord... So now, God is pouring out His judgment, not just on one nation like Egypt, but on all of creation. And just as Israel waited and waited and waited in the midst of the plagues and the judgments for God to come and finally rescue and deliver them, so now we, the new covenant people of God, the church, wait and wait and wait in the midst of God's judgments that he's pouring out on creation for God to finally, and finally come and complete um, our rescue and our exodus as he delivers us out of this world to the land that we've, we've been promised. But this is what we're to be thinking about when we see tornadoes and droughts and hurricanes, and flood warnings, and flooded basements, and all these things. When we see the brokenness of the creation of the world in which we live, when we see that, what we're to be thinking is that the created world in which we live is cursed and under God's judgment. God's judgment's being poured out just like the plagues all around us all over the world. And in the midst of it, here we are, the church, waiting, longing for God to come and complete our exodus and take us out of this world to the land that we've been promised, the new creation to come. And one of the reasons that we can be so confident and sure that he's going to do that and that our exodus is going to come is because we can look back at God's character and see what he did in the book of Exodus with his old covenant people and how he was faithful to deliver them out of the judgments and the plagues that were showered upon Egypt. Now as his new covenant people, we know God's faithfulness. We know his track record. And so we can be rest assured that he's going to deliver us and rescue out of this world as well. See, that's a different way to interpret Revelation and these judgments than a newspaper. And I would say a better way. But what's amazing is that that's, the exodus and the, the plagues of, in Egypt aren't, aren't the only Old Testament fulfillment and, and illusion in this passage. Instead, there's another important one 
And just think about it. Some of you might already be thinking about this, but, but where in the Old Testament do we see seven trumpets being blown in judgment? Where, where in the Old Testament do we see seven trumpets being blown in judgment? We see it in Joshua chapter 6. If you remember in the, the destruction of Jericho and the, the walls of Jericho, like do you, do you remember the story there? That, that after God rescued Israel out of Egypt and, and everything we just talked about with the plagues and all that stuff, after he does that, people of God wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, then they cross the Jordan River, and they're getting ready. They're on the cusp. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land. But before they enter in, what's in their way? The big, bad city of Jericho. And so then what do the people of Israel do? They give seven priests, seven trumpets, and they have them walk around Jericho for seven days blowing their trumpets. And on the seventh day, when the priests blew their trumpets, do you remember what happened? On the seventh day, when the priests blew their trumpets, God consumed the city in judgment. And the walls came tumbling down. The whole city came tumbling down, allowing Israel then safe passage into the promised land. Which is what we see here then when it comes to these seven trumpet judgments in Revelation. One trumpet blows. Second trumpet blows. Third trumpet blows. Fourth trumpet blows. Fifth trumpet blows. Sixth trumpet blows. And then finally it reaches the seventh trumpet. And when the seventh trumpet blows, which we'll see later on in a few weeks in chapter 11, when the seventh trumpet blows, it leads to what happened to Jericho. It leads to final, ultimate judgment that comes and that God pours out on this earth and leading then to our entrance and our entrance into the land that we've been promised, the new creation. Like those are the things that these trumpet judgments are to remind us of and how we're to read and understand Revelation and these trumpet judgments. Not with a newspaper trying to figure out what, what this alludes to and all that. Instead, we're to read them with the Old Testament, trying to figure out which Old Testament text that what we see in Revelation is the ultimate fulfillment of. And all that then. So that's the first question. How, how do we read? How do we understand these four trumpet judgments? We're to read them cyclically, not chronologically. We're to read them symbolically, not literally. And we're to read them with the Old Testament in mind and in hand, not a newspaper. Which then leads to our second question. We're going to fly through this and we're going to end with this one. Not spend as much time on this one, but it's important. The second question then that I want to ask then is, is this. If, if this is what these, these first four trumpet judgments mean, if this is how we should read them and understand them, then that begs the question, how should we respond to this then? How, how should we respond to these four trumpet judgments in our lives? What's, what's the application of this for our lives then? If this is what this means and how we should read and understand. What's, that, what's the application for us? Well, we should respond in, in one of two ways depend upon who you are here this morning. First, if you're here this morning, you're, you're not a Christian. You might be hearing all this and think, this is the craziest, whacked out thing you've ever heard in your life. Trust me, I get it. And you might be thinking, what in the world does any of this have to do with me? How is any of this relevant to me? What does any of this have to do with me? What, what I, how am I supposed to respond to, to this? Or you might be here this morning, you think you're a Christian. Like you're a Christian by name, you would, you would profess to be a Christian. But in reality, your, your life gives little to no evidence that you really are. Your life gives little to no evidence that you've really been spiritually born again and been made new. And so you think you are, but, but you're not. And so if you're, you're in one of those two categories here this morning, then here's the application for you. Here's how you ought to respond to, to everything we've seen this morning, and specifically these first four trumpet judgments that we've looked at. Your response should be this. 
See it on your handout. You should hear the four trumpet blasts that we've seen in chapter 8 here and be warned. You should be warned. You should allow these four trumpet judgments here to, to warn you of the final judgment that is still yet to come. Like, think about it. This is one of the primary purposes of trumpets all throughout the Bible. Especially in the, we talked about the walls of Jericho and, and from Joshua 6 just a little bit ago. Trumpets in the Bible serve as tornado sirens. Service tornado sirens. You know what tornado, tornado siren, when the tornado siren goes off, you know a tornado's coming. And so in the Bible, when, it, when trumpets go off, when trump, trumpets are blown, then that's to signify, that's a warning, that's a warning signal that signifies that judgment's coming. Judgment is coming. That's, that's what trumpets do. They're, they're warning blast to declare, to warn people that judgment is coming. And that was the case. They're walking around the wall, city of Jericho. One day, two day, three day, four day, five day, six day. All those six days were warnings. Trumpet blast warning for six days that judgment is coming. And then on the seventh day, boom, judgment came and it was all done. And that's what these seven or these first four especially are to do for us as well. Or for you this morning as a non-Christian or for those that think you are but you're really not. These four trumpet judgments aren't the final judgment. They're not the final judgment. The final judgment is still to come. It's not coming until Jesus returns. We're going to see that when the seventh trumpet is blown. But these four judgments, trumpet judgments, they're, they're what you might call preliminary judgments. They're partial preliminary judgments that serve as, as warning blast, warning you that there's a judgment that's about to come. And so if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, like you might not be able to, to hear, these, the, hear these trumpet blast with your natural ears. Like you, I probably don't hear, oh, that's a trumpet. There's a trumpet. There's a trumpet. I'm sure you probably don't hear trumpets going off around you. But they are. Trumpets are sounding off day in and day out, every second of every, every day in the form of flooded basements, in the form of tornadoes, in the form of droughts and raging wildfires and earthquakes and burned up grass that you haven't watered in weeks and all this other brokenness that we see in our creation. All of these things are preliminary judgments and they're all trumpet blasts from God shouting to you, warning to you of a greater, more ultimate judgment that is terrifying, that is still yet to come and that is coming your way one day. And so then if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. I want you to think about these trumpet judgments this way. They are warnings of a judgment that is still yet to come, that is coming. But they're also God's grace and His kindness to you. That He would even warn you. He doesn't have to warn you. He doesn't have to give you a heads up. He would be just to blindside you. But he doesn't. Instead, in his grace and in his kindness toward you, he sends off these trumpet warnings all around you to warn you of the greater, more ultimate judgment that is to come. And so, if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, how do you respond? Heed these warnings. Heed these warnings. Don't turn a deaf ear to these warnings. Instead, let these warnings cause you to trust and run to Jesus. Because he's the only way for any of us to escape and to be rescued from the final judgment that's to come. And here's how. 
When Jesus died on the cross, he took the final judgment that you deserve upon himself in your place as your substitute so that when the final judgment comes, it won't fall on you because it's already fallen on Jesus instead of you. But the reality is this isn't true for everyone. It's only true for those who trust and believe and place their hope in Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross in their place as their only hope for being rescued and delivered from the final judgment that is still yet to come. So if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, then respond to these warnings by heeding, by, by, by heeding these warnings, by turning and trusting in Jesus and placing your faith in him as your only hope. But if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, then what's the application of this for you? Well, the application, there's a lot we could give, but let me at least give this one. It's this. It's to hear these four trumpet blasts that we've seen here and be hopeful that our final, ultimate deliverance is getting really close. It, it's near. In other words, these trumpet blasts here, they, they have two functions. For, for the non-Christian, just like the plagues in, in Egypt, they had two functions. For, for the non-Christian, these trumpet blasts serve as a warning, warning you of the judgment that is about to come. For us as Christians, though, these trumpet blasts remind us that our final, ultimate deliverance out of this world is getting really close. It, it's really near. Like, it, 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 it's, it's coming. We, we don't know when. We don't know exactly how. We don't know how much longer it's going to be. But with each trumpet blast, we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And because of that, then, patiently endure. Persevere. Keep, keep on keeping on. Like, don't, don't give up. Yeah, there, there's temptations all around you trying to entice you to fall in love with this, with this world and to abandon Jesus, but, but in the midst of that, endure. Yeah, there, there's suffering, there's hardship, there's difficulties that are causing you to try and lose hope, but in the midst of all that, endure. Yeah, there's false teaching and false ideologies and, and ideas that are trying to cause you to compromise the gospel and give up on the gospel and believe all these other godly things and, and all that. But in, in the midst of that, like endure, 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 endure. Why? Because our exodus out of this fallen, broken, cursed world with judgments preliminary judgments all around us. Our exodus out of this mess is near. It's closer and closer with each trumpet blast we hear. So be steadfast, faithfully endure, persevere until that ultimate final judgment comes. And we experience the greater, more ultimate exodus out of this world into, lo- into the land that we've promised, the new creation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for even weird passages and terrifying passages of scripture that leave us just scratching our heads trying to make sense of whole host of things and questions that we have as a result. But God, I pray more than anything, that pray that we're able to see that even in a complex and difficult passage of Scripture, boy, it's extremely relevant. It's extremely relevant. And so God, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that's, that's not a Christian or somebody who thinks they are and they're, they're really not, I pray just that the truth of your word and the, the warning blast of of, of these trumpet judgments that are going on all around us would open their eyes to be able to hear and to be able to see the warnings that, their ju- that your judgment is coming and that they would turn and that they would trust in Jesus as their only hope, believing that he has paid their price, substituted himself in their place to absorb the final judgment that they deserve for their sin. And it's only through him that they can be rescued and saved. 
from the judgment and the wrath that they deserve. Pray that there's anybody here that they would even trust and place their hope in Jesus in this way right this very moment. And for us as Christians, God, I pray that you'd help us to put ourselves in the sandals of those in Israel all the way back in Exodus. And just as judgments were going on and plagues all going on all around them, Lord, that in the midst of that, you heard their cry, you heard their prayers for deliverance, and it was through the judgments that you delivered them. And I pray that as we look back on what you did for them, your old covenant people, that we would have confidence and assurance that you will do that for us now as your new covenant people. And the reality of that confidence and assurance would cause us to keep on keeping on, to be faithful, to persevere, to faithfully endure in the midst of all the craziness and in the midst of all the, the brokenness, in the midst of all the temptations and enticements and suffering and difficulties that we face and we walk through in this cursed world. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.